Please help spread the message of Frequency Specific Microcurrent by clicking on the like button. You can subscribe to us on YouTube or any podcast app. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. You can find the podcast transcription at FrequencySpecific.com, as well as more information about Frequency Specific Microcurrent. We're here now. Hi. Hi. I'm going to adjust a whole bunch of things. My computer restarted like a few minutes ago. Oh, don't you love it when it does that? No. Yeah. And it makes me very nervous. It says updates not installed. Let's not do it now. Okay. And that's what happened to me just a little while ago. And my dogs are running around. So this could be an interesting podcast. It's, it's a day. It's a day. It's Wednesday. It's been a week already. Yeah. And I didn't get the memo about white because I left the house this morning at 10 minutes to nine to take my dog to the vet somehow didn't have the appointment on their computer. I came back and then I started running errands and came in the door 12 minutes ago. We're here. Here, I'm so proud. Yeah, I have an idea. Okay. And it's funny because I, I have so many ideas about how we're going to layer the themes, and then it always just takes a turn organically right what? before we come on. I was compiling, what I wanted to do was start off the year with some simplistic stories and anecdotes. And because we always talk about the crazy, complicated cases that we have. And those are great. See the look on my face. I do. And <laughs> it's because we got some very interesting questions coming in lately. And by interesting, really? Huh? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That one. It's really? Yeah. Uh, have you looked at the slot? So this is what I'm going with. Maybe it's from somebody who hasn't taken the course. Yes. And those are the ones, huh? That's the first question. That's the first question. <laughs> and those are the ones where I write back to you and Kevin and say, I'm not answering this. You can if you want to come out. <laughs> but what I would like to do is to just break down some things that maybe we take for granted that everybody knows. And maybe it might be a good refresher to just talk about certain things. We all get caught up in the frequencies that we find are slam dunks. And sometimes I know for myself that clouds my objective thinking sometimes because I think oh it's 40 and 10 or it's 4396 and this is going to help and it's this and it's that and it's no just stop for a second my excitement the reason I was bouncing up and down my, in the chair is going to really diverge shall we say from the simplistic because yesterday I had 19 year old CRPS patient drive from Idaho to Troutdale with her parents to get treated. And she's had CRPS for four, five years. Medial meniscus injury playing, so uh, no, doing literally just an exercise where they were standing up and down from a chair and she cracked her medial meniscus and then got pain down the leg and then about two years later, an orthopedic surgeon re-looked at the MRI and said, no, really, the meniscus has got a tear in it. And I think you have CRPS, but let's, let's do the surgery and see what happens. So she had CRPS. And in the wonderful and history. CRPS is for people who are, lay people who are listening. Oh, yeah. Complex regional pain syndrome, which doesn't mean anything, used to be RSD, which means even less. Right. It's an injury that makes the peripheral nerve, usually a cutaneous nerve, disconnect from the peripheral tissue. So there was something in her wonderful written out history, no childhood trauma, no central sensitization, sweet, charming athlete played soccer from the age of four to the age of 14, athlete, stoic. And something that she said about starting with anxiety when she was nine or 10. And then something in the history about 
getting a wrist injury from lifting boxes. And the theme that I want to put from my story is put it all together. Yeah. She, in addition to the CRPS in her left leg, she had chest pain, pressure in her chest and pain in her chest. Been to the ER, no cardiac stuff. That was fine. And but this wrist from just lifting boxes and the anxiety. Those of you that have seen the Vegas webinar know where I'm going. Before I did anything else, I said, do me a favor, put your hand on the desk and lift your little finger. And it went to 95 degrees. And then I said, stretch out your arm and it looked okay. It wasn't like a minus 10, but it was a minus five. So she was nine out of nine on the Baton score. So I got to explain to them what hypermobility does that causes her anxiety and her anorexia. And just knowing where it came from, the fact that we have this information base because we have the ability to treat things, just knowing where it came from. Right. Anxiety does not come from space. Mm -hmm. And I understand about anorexia, like you can't control the nerve pain in your leg, but you can control what you eat. But you have to understand the role of the vagus and your hypermobility and your nerve pain in contributing to the anorexia. Mm -hmm. So this is the treat the whole patient part. Mm -hmm. So you have a 19 year old that probably has the deep down desire to be the perfect person, right? Mm -hmm. Sweetheart. And then she has CRPS on, I did a sensory exam and she's hypersensitive from T3 to T6. Her chest pain it is nerve pain. Mm -hmm. And she's like a normal kid that's like this, but because she has hypermobility, Ehlers-Danlos, she has leaky discs at T3 through T6 on two machines on the left-hand side. I treated disc repair across her thoracic spine and nerve pain. 30 minutes, the chest pain was gone. Neck to feet, did 124 and 77, torn and broken in connective tissue. So we treated the chest pain and the disc and the Ehlers-Danlos on the right-hand side of the table. Left side, we had one machine going from neck to feet to treat the spinal cord for sensitization with 40 and 10 and one from her low back to her foot because that saphenous nerve starts in the lumbar spine. So you just take the whole thing down. And then from the knee to the foot, started treating the CRPS. So we trace, just like it is in the video, we traced the sensitive area. With, and so she's got felt pin markers. Unfortunately, it's permanent marker. And just 40 and 396, and after about 40 minutes, the pain was coming down, but then it started being sharp. So I had to switch to 40, quiet the sympathetics. So CRPS is the sympathetics get disconnected. So the area is cold. Her left leg was, lower leg was... Uh, 91 degrees her right lower leg was 96 and so did the sympathetics and you just sit there and I had another machine on concussion in Vegas that we ran twice and we just talked and we ha ended up with one two three four five six seven seven machines on it and you don't have to do anything. I didn't have to use my hands. 
of all the things we treat, nerve pain is the easiest. We can get to the simple stuff, but the theme for me today, because at the end of basically, four, we started at 1240, she left the office at 430. The end of four hours, she was completely out of pain. She was a baiting six out of nine. So we have to work on that on Thursday. The RSD was gone. CRPS was gone. Had to teach her to walk again. And I had to hand her, tell her mom where to find the Kleenex on the desk. And because we can't, it, it's just, you change somebody's life like that. And if I'm not about selling machines, but if all you had was one custom care because you only wanted to spend $2,000, no. It would just take you a really long time. No, it's actually with CRPS, it's not possible. You have to have one machine that takes down spinal sensitization. And then once the nerve pain started to go down and the sensory field went from this big to that big. I asked her, is the pain worse at night? And she said, oh yeah, that's when it's the worst. And it's, that's how you know it's central sensitization. So it's like thalamic pain. So as soon as she told me that, I switched that machine from the spinal cord to the thalamus. And she got a little sleepy. And then I asked her, does your right foot hurt mm. ever? And she said, yeah, but that's because I put so much more weight on it. And I said, no, it's because your sensory cortex, the two feet are right next to each other. Mm -hmm. We did quiet the sensory cortex to take that down. And yeah, it you couldn't do it. The FSM practitioner in Idaho that treated her before me had one machine. And he put a frequency on and said, if it makes it worse, call me. And within 15 minutes, it was worse. And so we treated her four times. And then she came over here. And it was easy. It, it's like the script is in the core now. Right. I used to treat, teach this in the advanced. Right. Script's in the core. So. Anyway, so here's my nugget that I want to splice in, not because I'm determined to make this about being basic. No, we can go back to basic. But no, but hear me out for a second. The most quote unquote complicated cases that would normally make me shut a file and say outside of my scope or I can't help you or this is too much or blah, blah, blah. There's always pieces of information that you can break down in order to see the big picture. So I'm going to use a running analogy for a minute, just because right. this is all I know. No long distance runner sets out when they put their shoes on and leaves the house and thinks I have to run 13 miles today. That is an overwhelming experience that you just can't break it down. But what do we do? We go mile by mile. I'm just going to get to the mailbox today. I'm just going to get around the corner. I'm going to get down the street. And then there's a little bit. So when you get those complicated histories or those scary histories, like what you just have, the first step is to take a deep breath and break it down. And you have to break it down in order to build a comprehensive picture. So I think the big take home in what you were saying is you can't just be myopic in your treatment approach, which I think we all, even before FSM, we get guilty of nerve pain. I've got that weakness. I can fix that hypertonicity. I can fix that. Yes. These are all little pieces, but again, thinking, how did it get there? So it's not just thinking a person has anxiety. Okay, okay, but why? Nobody asks the why. And if you ask why with every big symptom that they're coming in or complaint, you can start to build the story. Well, where, and the, right? the watchword, I did a webinar one time about that's titled, take it apart. And you take a piece at a time and I think it's only 
in the FSM community. I've never heard, read it in the literature or heard it from anybody else. It is only in the FSM community where anybody would connect Ehlers-Danlos and vagal dysfunction, right? So hypermobility causes little teeny tissue tears that leaves you little fragments of torn tissue that land on the vagus. The vagus tells the brain there's a problem. The brain tells the vagus to just shut itself down because obviously we're being dragged through the jungle by a tiger. And also when I took this girl's pulse as part of your initial exam, her resting pulse is 83. It should be 62. So that confirms, yes, it's a vagus. And it's, so it's follow the breadcrumbs and treat what you can. Okay, she's got thoracic discs, I can treat those. And she's got nerve pain in her chest, I, I can treat that. So that's two machines. Right. And then she's got earlier Stanlos. Okay, I can treat that. Yeah. You do that on the right side. And then all of the nerve stuff you can do on the left. And it gives you the chance to treat the whole person. Right. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna build on your story in a more simplistic I, I knew you could way. do this. But the reason why I do this is not just to hear myself talk, but to give people listening the two ends of the spectrum and the rainbow and then everything in between. So okay. something as easy as somebody coming in with glute pain on the left, athlete, only symptom. I feel like someone's punched my butt cheek. Okay. X-rays haven't been taken of their hip, but... X-rays of their back show some degeneration, L4, L5, L5, S1, somebody in their early 50s, nothing crazy, no back pain, went for a ton of soft tissue work where somebody just puts their elbow in the piriformis and goes to town. That makes it worse. Chiropractic adjustments don't do anything. Physical therapy diagnosis was weak glutes. That's something that just makes me want to, we, we've talked about weak glutes before. I just think it's almost the same as like frozen shoulder. Somebody just throws that term out there. Did all the strengthening exercises that their weak glutes could need doesn't get better. Before FSM, I never had a pinwheel in my toolbox. I just never did it. The person didn't have any referrals, didn't have any um, numbness, pain, nothing going down the leg, but I still brought out my pinwheel. Person's why? And I'm like, just because you don't feel pain doesn't mean there aren't areas that could be numb. And sure enough, to their surprise, had a numb patch on the medial ankle. She's like, oh, look at that. I can't feel that at all. All four. Oh, okay. That, duh. So for those of you who don't go with nerve roots, it's go on Amazon and just get a little poster of dermatomes because it can help you beyond measure. If it's not for your own education, the patient will look at that and be like, oh, I have pain all in that green stripe, like that person on the wall does. I'm like, okay. So sure enough, and the old biomechanics in me was looking at the pelvis and what is tilted and what is this and what could be causing that. But that little numb patch was the one thing that set me back up to run torn and broken in the annulus. Because if there's degeneration there, there's going to be splinting and guarding all the way down. Again, the pelvis doesn't get like that from outer space, unless there was like a, an accident or a slip and fall. This is all years and years of compensation and guarding because this is an athlete who had a decent amount of degeneration and it was L4 that was affected. I would have never gone there if it wasn't for my pinwheel because I would have had no real reason to look there. All the pain in the nerve, scarring in the muscle, all those things that we think are going to help a tight glute or a weak glute was not going to budge because within minutes of running 124 and 710, torn and broken in the annulus, because that's where the degeneration starts is those little cracks that form in the disc. That's what causes the muscles to splint. 
instant relief. My hands weren't even on the patient. You know, when you're treating nerves, that's the other reason that FSM practitioners check nerves. Number one is part of a complete exam, but the other the reason that FSM practitioners check nerves is we have a way to treat it. Yeah. Nobody else checks for it because they can't treat it anyway. Why would you check? It's right. the same thing with Ehlers-Danlos or hypermobility syndrome. Mm-hmm. Why would you check? You can't do anything about it. Right. So once you can do something, I can. Once you can do something about it, you check. Doesn't yeah. it take what? 90 seconds, 60 seconds to do that. And the cool thing was after two minutes, check the pinwheel. It's like, I can, I can feel that again. I'm like, yeah. And that doesn't mean you don't do all the things that you normally would. I still treated the muscle. I still helped that glute relax. I still helped the spinal splinting. I still treated the psoas. I still treated all the things. And the, please tell me the femoral plexus and the quads and the, okay, good. We yeah. glutes take me back to that one slide every time. I know. However, like those muscles that were splinting the muscles, and there's always going to be muscles that turn off when there's trauma to the cord and the disc. And there's always muscles that are going to be turned on. So it's your job after to balance the scales once again, take off the, the splinting, the, the, that's going to take care of itself because the source of danger is now neutralized. So those hypervigilant muscles are like, oh, I'm good. I can take a break. Super. Cause I'm super tired. Like, thank you very much. Yeah. And that takes us back to the cerebellum. Yes. Does not notify you. You don't need to know why your glute is turned off. No. You really don't. No. And I don't care. Okay. I have the glute turned off for a reason. And it also does not negotiate. You can put your elbow in it. You can do a manipulation on it. You can do strength. You can do anything you want. And yeah. the cerebellum does not negotiate. Yeah. The cerebellum cares about the cause. And when you take the cause away, treat the disc, treat the nerve, treat the adhesions in nerve, and the cerebellum goes, okay, fine. Now I can let go of this poor muscle. Really sorry. I think if you're going to anthropomorphize the cerebellum, it's a dictator, doesn't notify, doesn't negotiate. But I really think ultimately it feels sorry for whatever muscle it made tight or weak. Really sorry, glute. I agree. I agree. I don't think I don't think anything is ever done nefariously. Uh, it has the best of intentions, right? It's absolutely trying to keep us safe, and that kind of goes to. I'm going to just interject with my quote because it's going to circumvent right away. And I don't know where I found it, but um, feeling safe is the treatment, and creating safety is the work. Oh, do that again. Feeling safe is the treatment. And creating safety is the work. That's what we do. That's what we do. And it has become more and more clear, especially in the last year. And I guess it's just because, actually, I don't know why, but I'm assuming it's because of being able to understand the nervous system at the depth that I do now and how nothing is going to resolve, nothing is going to hold without that feeling of safety. At the very most simplistic terms, a muscle will not relax if there is danger, if that person does not feel safe, and you are not going to get optimal recruitment. Those muscles are not going to fire. That person cannot become strong. That person cannot be recalibrated. Coordinated. Coordinated if there's not a sense of safety in performing that movement. Yep. And that that has to happen. And Everything is connected to everything. Had I just treated the leg without treating the spinal cord, the thalamus, the sensory cortex, and then increased secretions in the cerebellum. So increasing secretions in the cerebellum because her foot hasn't moved in five years, basically. 
and running scarring in the nerve between her knee and her toes while she's moving. And we're creating safety so the cerebellum can go, oh, like it's safe. I can move, I can move this foot now. And everything's connected to everything. And we treat it because we can. We look for it because we can. And just so everybody knows, um, I'm going to rewrite the advanced. It's not a list of frequencies. I'm doing the same thing that I did in the core. It's how to think about it only in a more complex way. So basically that case from yesterday, that's an advanced thought process. Right. Because why would a 19-year-old who lifted boxes have chest pain? Huh? Yeah. Leaky discs. Why would a 19-year-old have four leaky discs in the put your hand on the desk and lift a little finger? And it, ultimately it's simple. Again, and it sounds elitist sometimes, right? When you say it's just not that hard. Um, breaking it down can be complicated. But again, you're going mile by mile, block by block. Take this. What could that be from? Take this. And if I'm a flow chart person, yes, I have my online charting stuff, but I always have a pen and paper because I'm always trying to connect dots and bubbles together. And once you see the common theme and you, again, it's mileage, you're, you talked about it before with pattern recognition, that is what we do. It helps put it together a little bit faster. But again, this overcomplicated, very complex patient history doesn't have to look complicated and complex. If you just take the things apart, that things that you can treat and think about why did it get there? from something super complicated like CRPS or something really simple like a tight glute. Why is the glute tight? Why is the medial ankle numb? Right. And what does that have to do with the tight glute? Right. Since the glute is not innervated by L4. Yeah. And when I say things like, this isn't that hard, I always look up and make sure there's no thunderclouds or lightning that's going to strike. But an athlete who has degeneration is not going to stop doing their activity because they never had back pain. What's going to happen is there's going to be compensation, the glute, the piriformis, everything is going to tighten up. It's going to pull away. It's going to try to create a new pelvic model to shock absorb. Oh, I have one. Speaking of which, speaking of hip and pelvis, I have a patient that's just 68 but he's super healthy, great attitude, and he's getting ready to retire. So he said, I'm working with a trainer or physical therapist and working on joint flexibility. My hips are really tight. Hmm. Laid him on the table and checked his hip. External rotation's great, internal rotation's great. For those of you that don't know about hip motion the first motion you lose when you have hip degeneration is internal rotation if 15 degrees of internal rotation like a basically the 20 year old full external rotation but when i brought his knee to his chest it stopped at 90 degrees and i watched the back of his head and it went like that Mm -hmm. tip back when I pushed on his knee okay. and in our world because we can I wrapped a towel around his neck put a washcloth on his sacrum or a towel on his sacrum and ran scarring in the dura yeah. and he said wait what made you think of that I said because there's nothing wrong with your hips and the reason you can't bring your knee to your chest is that your pelvis won't tip. Yeah, but what's that got to do with my neck? And I, <laughs> when I push your knee up, your head tilts back. 
It did? Yeah, just a little. And so we treated scarring in the dura. Now his knee never did go to his chest, so there's something else that needs to get worked on. We got an extra 20, 25 degrees, and he was walking differently. And there's no other world where anyone that's not an FSM practitioner would even look for that connection because they don't have a way to treat it. You can treat it, then you'll go looking for it. Yeah. That was a quote that we had a while ago. Look for something that no one else can see. Yeah. And the only reason we look for things that nobody else sees or even looks for is because we have a way of treating them. Right. I just love being us. <laughs> I do too. I'm going to get to the questions that we had. And then I think there is one on here just because we tell people to write in. So I want to make sure that we're getting to their There's questions. nobody on the chat. Are you guys oh. there? There's a Q&A, I think. Okay. Oh, there's One of the questions I think that was written was about people who are sensitive to frequencies. What does that even mean? How I don't know. So that, that was what I was going to ask because being sensitive can fre to frequency can be really great. It can help you diagnose things. I know. But have you met anybody or had anybody that can't tolerate FSM? No. But somebody that says they're sensitive to frequencies might mean I'm sensitive to EMF. Okay. So cell phones. And so technical language, like the difference between high frequency, like cell phone towers and computers and whatever, that made more sense. That's how I interpreted that. And okay. unless she's a, an FSM patient, but my impression reading the question was not that she couldn't, that, that she'd ever been treated with FSM. Okay. Because I have patients that are very sensitive to, like I said, EMF pollution, that sort of thing. And they are sensitive to frequent. They pick up on things very fast with the treatment. They're like, oh, that's smushing. Oh, that's not. This is done. That can be very helpful if they're feeling changes before you can think about changing them. But I haven't had anybody yet that's too sensitive for what we do or do you know what I mean? They just respond. I had one person a million years ago. And what I found out is, so with that one patient in 1990, we turned the machine on and ran the machine in the doorway of the room. She was that sensitive. Okay. But what I know now is in that patient group, if you read Neil Nathan's work, and if you look at the mold webinar, patients who have mold infection or contamination become electrically sensitive. And the reason for that is more than I can go into or remember even, right. but I put those two together. Okay. So when somebody is super EMF sensitive, the first thing I honestly treat is the vagus. Yeah. And there is a frequency for EMF sensitivity in the advanced. Yeah. And I run that on the vagus, the midbrain, because what people feel when they say they're EMF sensitive mm. is anxiety or fear. Okay. That's limiting. Yeah. That's what do you mean you don't tolerate it? Right. You just don't feel good. Does it hurt? No, I don't feel good. Where do you feel physically? It's in the limbic system. It's 89. It's the midbrain. Right. I'll treat that. But I also go just to rule it out. It's worth $300 to know that I don't have mold. How do you know? Where have you lived? And then you take them through that history and you, you can find the place. Yeah. So that's a thought. And then as good as FSM is, they still need to get mold remediation done oh, and, and all right. the other things. Like That is my least favorite diagnosis to give somebody. It is a bother. I had one. I had a patient that said she's from Europe and English is not her first language, but she said that the frequency 94 on channel A 
and she wasn't specific about what was running on channel B. Okay. Made her hair fall out. That's a good face. And it's like. How did they know it was that though? And in that specific moment, the frequency came and then all the hair, like a porcupine. <laughs> just, it, so I don't understand how that. And she said, made my hair fall. I'm assuming she meant fall out. Yeah. And my only answer was, I've never seen that happen. So I have no idea. Yeah. That'd be really odd that you could put that together. Yeah. There's a lot of things that make your hair fall out. None of them are instant. And none of them happen that fast. No. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not the only one that's confused by that. I just love 94. I love 94 on A. Yep. And 294. Let's talk about this for a second because they're both trauma. Right. But they work very differently. 94 is for the nervous system. Yeah. Any part of the nervous system. Yeah. And 294 is for physical tissue, which could also be a part of the brain. Remember the lady with the really t screaming tight pelvic floor muscles? Yes. My uterus never had time to recover. Yeah. And the frequency that made the pelvic floor muscles relax was trauma in the uterus. Yeah. 294 in the uterus. Yeah. That changed my life. Yeah. Made my brain hurt. Yeah, I remember that. There for that. I was. But when we break that down again, so now like everything to me is neurocentric. <laughs> Thanks for that, by the way. <laughs> time. <laughs> so someone who used to be very biomechanical and structural would go to 94 first. But then when I think about everything is at least yep. by the nervous system. So I, I throw both at on I'll be honest. I'll start with the physical sometimes if it's clearly physical and mechanical. Yeah. But to finish it, you have to reconnect the periphery to the brain. Right. And the only reason we think about it is because we can do it in 10 minutes. Yeah. Whereas other professions that don't have the tools that we have do these exercises, walk backwards, do this. And in about six weeks, everything will be coordinated. And in our world, we do 40 and 89. So they're not afraid to move it, quiet the midbrain. Yeah. And then we do increased secretions in the cerebellum and they're coordinated in 10 or 15 minutes. We talk about like the reboot or wipe and load in the sports course in the sports advance course. We add 94 into that wipe and load because sometimes 40 just doesn't do it. And especially if there was a traumatic event that led up to the injury. So with sports, we talk about a side tackle. We talk about something that really did set the nervous system on high alert. That has been very helpful as well. It makes perfect sense. The limbic system, the thalamus, and the hippocampus never forget. And I love your phrase, just tell the limbic system to take a nap. We just need to, 94, I'm yeah. really sorry that it hurt, that your knee got hurt. And when you say your knee is connected to your hippocampus and your thalamus because it hurt, that's the thalamus, and the hippocampus has its job to remember that. Yeah. And so you can treat the knee, but unless you treat the brain, you're not finished. You're not finished. It, it almost is like when I get referrals from PTs, from patients that have been to PT, and it wasn't successful. I know a lot of brilliant PTs that I would fly across the country to send my children to, yeah. but often than not, I am finding the patients that I am getting from quote unquote failed PT is because the PT was too myopic shoulder injury that was only treating the glenoid humeral joint and didn't touch the scapulothoracic articulation or, or, the, or the neck or the ribs. So this is a whole other podcast, like to yeah. alcoholic beverages that I need to debrief from. So I don't want to <laughs> get there, but again, to circumvent back to everything is connected to everything. 
that is just straight up biomechanics, how everything is connected and works. And to have a comprehensive treatment, you have to look big picture. Right. So with this 19 year old that I'll be seeing tomorrow, tomorrow she goes into the gym because her habitual posture is to slump at that T3, 4, 5, and 6 area. And we need to get her into the gym and get those upper thoracic muscles to fire and support proper posture. Get her on the reformer and support abdominal strength. Yeah. And do that after we've run 124 and 77. The muscles don't have full strength. You'll have the right words for this. If the connective tissue is weak and is going to tear, if you fire the muscle at 100%, the brain's not going to let you fire that muscle at 100%. Absolutely. Because the connective tissue that attaches the muscle to the bone is going to get injured. Right. And And there's a reason why, like the first exercises we do post-operatively or post-injury or muscle setting exercises are quote unquote, like isometric. So there is no range, there's no change in the range of motion. It's just firing. So there's no actual shortening. There's no actin and myosin. There's no sliding filament mechanism. It's hundred percent recruitment. So right. everything has to be online first in order for concentric and eccentric to come into play after. So there's a sequence that, and like you said, just to get the firing, just to get that action potential to happen, there has to be safety. The prequel to the firing has to be, hey, I have a good idea. <laughs> and but, so that's what has to happen. Not like there's danger, we have to do this. That It'll never work like that. And the other thing is when everything is connected to everything, where does muscle contraction start? It starts in the sensory motor cortex. Yeah. Where the sensory motor cortex says, I am going to do this with my arm. And that goes down through the thalamus and the hippocampus and the thalamus and the hippocampus say, okay, that's going to be safe. And then the cerebellum coordinates the movement, sends it down to the spinal cord. And what was the speed you were talking about for nerve versus fascia? So the connection you just described our our typical connection is 175 miles per hour okay i thought you said 200 there's 200 and 400 fascia fascia is 400 700 miles per hour okay yeah so the nervous system talks to the fascia before it talks to the muscle i don't know if it's before in conjunction in unison the jury is still out on how they have differentiated between the two action potentials so because the The fascia can't think for itself. It can't say. No, exactly. And so they are paying respect to our central nervous system. That's kind. Um, Yes. And it is like just breaking down a toddler having a temper tantrum. Like you were saying, it's going down to say, I'm really sorry your knee is hurt. I see you. I hear you. I'm respecting the fact that you are panicking right now. Here's a blanket and a lollipop and you need to just go sit over there for just two seconds. I'll be right back. You're yeah. going to be fine. You're going to be really happy over there. You have a little break. You have a little sleep. When you wake up, it's all going to be better. Yeah, I promise. All right. A couple of Q&A. Let's look at Kate's because it follows up on the patient before. I have had a patient who could only tolerate small amounts of FSM due to Lyme disease and had to work up slowly because the Herxheimer reactions. So it wasn't the frequency, but the release of toxins, which is why I go looking for mold and Lyme and uh, root canals. Good point. Okay, Manette. Herbs palsy. Herbs palsy is basically a brachial plexus traction injury in an infant. It's when the baby's being delivered, the head comes out, one shoulder goes out and the other shoulder gets stuck under the pubic bone and they pull the kid out or the kid gets pushed out and the brachial plexus gets tractioned. We've got shoulder range of motion to 90 degrees using FSM, more movement, 
difficulty with supination of the forearm. No, there's no necrosis. It's 40 and 396, Minette, and 81 and 396. It's not bleeding. It's not torn and broken. What happens is it's a nerve traction injury. And so 124 doesn't help with that so much. The ones that I treated were all at Cleveland Clinic. And the long thoracic nerve is part of what messes up the shoulder. Yeah. But it's supination of the forearm, which is C7. Correction, supination is seven, right? I think so. I'd go from the neck to the wrist with the contacts because we did have questions about where do you put the contacts right. where the nerve starts mm -hmm. to where the nerve ends and what you're trying to activate are the supinators mm -hmm. so 40 and 396 is a start and a child is six months old so you might have adhesions if you look in netter at the nerves ulnar nerve radial nerve median nerve where they go through the fascia, nerve artery vein fascia. Here, there might be adhesions in the nerve that where the nerve would get injured if you supinated. Mm -hmm. So the supinators could be inhibited because yep. of adhesions in the nerve, but it also could be just increased secretions in the nerve and make sure the whole pathway is clear do 40 first mm -hmm. then do scar tissue yeah. and you have to get knitter out and look at the whole brachial plexus mm -hmm. and then look i'm pretty sure sup supination is this way so it's that way is that radial nerve five mm -hmm. six six seven mm -hmm. that's the upper part of the brachial plexus Anyway, so it's scarred and then increased secretions is where I'd go. It's not the spinal cord. What's really cool about what you've done, Manette, is you got too complicated. Herb's palsy is really straightforward. It's a straight up brachial plexus injury. It's a traction injury. You take the nerve outside of the nerve that has the sodium potassium channels and you stretch it. So they basically break, like mm -hmm. they just can't do their thing. Yeah. So you run inflammation, probably torn and broken, definitely trauma. But then when it comes to, and because it's been injured, they'll might've been bleeding. So you do scarring, release all the adhesions and then just, 81 and 396 is amazing in herbs palsy and almost any nerve. That's how you finish. Yeah. Is get it to secrete again. But good job. Yeah, herbs, you'll be able to do it. Don't worry. Don't fret. And then she said she got more movement with 81 396. Oh, she did? Oh, good. Yeah. That makes sense. So, oh, oh, I see there's a, I, so try 13 and see if it's just inhibited. This must be from a patient. I have a custom care with protocols and not one for shingles and cold sores. So go back to the practitioner that programmed it for you and have them put shingles on it. Yep. Inflammation, asthma, arthritis, when I'm sleep deprived, coincides with alcoholism. Being sleep deprived coincides with developing a course cold sore. It's not the FSM. Yeah. I'm going to bet just being sleep deprived and your immune system says, you need to go to bed. You're going to get a virus now. Accelerating the function, reducing inflammation. Okay. Reducing inflammation might turn down your immune system to cause the cold sore. Correlation isn't causation. Good statement. Yeah. Yep. Yes. There you go. You got to the conclusion right there at the end. Have the yeah. practitioner program shingles. Don't get sleep deprived. Yeah. And when they program shingles, it sounds like immune support might be a better thing to put on there too. 
So when you know you're sleep deprived, yeah. but do immune support. The immune support is a must on all the athletes that get custom cares from me because of the amount that they travel and they get stressed and their frequency of using it increases as the season goes on. So preseason, beginning of the season, everybody's happy. The load isn't that bad, but as they get stressed, as they get taxed, as they just get more and more run down, I make them run it more and more often. And I think it really helps. Agreed. And sleep, good old fashioned sleep. So running concussion and concussion in Vegas at night, just to get them to sleep is a game changer. And I do a night program that starts with concussion, actually starts with sleep. Mm -hmm. And this is for somebody that has a converter. Yeah. Starts with sleep, then concussion in Vegas. Yeah. And yeah, heart health. Yes. All the things. All right. We have, we have two minutes. Last one. Do you use the magnetic converter pucks with clients? What overall guidelines do you recommend? Is it better on certain tissues? I'll just speak for myself. I only treat myself with the magnetic converter because during the day, I just don't have time. I don't treat myself at all. Right. So I don't use it in the clinic unless it's an infant mm -hmm. or unless I just run out of machines and there's something I need to run like concussion in Vegas. Right. Even things, remember the part where I said that alternating current doesn't work for nerve pain? Yep. Yeah, I lied. Yeah. Um, because there are times, be just because of my neck history, I'll wake up with nerve pain and or, and or one or both of my hands numb. And I put, I have nerve pain as number five on my custom care. I put one puck at my neck, put the other puck in my hand, punch the button, turn the light off and go back to sleep. And I'm out of pain and my hand isn't numb in about five minutes. Wow. Alternating current. So I use it to treat myself at home. I don't use it in the clinic yeah. because it's weird enough using current. You can't feel and frequencies you can't hear without using something with blinky lights and hockey pucks the alarm is going off it is four o'clock wow amazing that it was, was really fun it was a good one it just it, they're always good let's face it there's always a, a story and something to learn and share the advance is coming up i can't wait we can do this in person yes i'm so excited so much fun doing it in person. The sports course is now sold out. So is the sports advance, but people always have to leave and bail last minute. So there is a wait list. So feel free to still email me. And now the podcast is on Wednesday yes. and you have the sports advanced on how are we just going to do the podcast I think, later? I think the last time we did it, we just did it an hour later and it was so much fun, like running from the class and yeah, uh, yeah, it's oh, cool. So, okay. We can start the sports advance an hour earlier. And if we do the podcast an hour later, we'll just, we'll be fine. It, it all works out. It always yeah. does. There you go. Everybody, thanks for coming. Keep all those questions coming and we'll keep yes. them. And we'll see you next week. See you next week. Do good things. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.